Hello and welcome to Life and Whiskey. This is video number two, Getting in Shape, part of my elk hunting series. And today we are going to be drinking Evan, gosh darn it, I'm not very good at this, Evan Williams Black Label. Uh, so this is going to be just a step up in price from the green label that I featured in the first video. And uh, I bought that black label for $10.49, so we're not breaking the bank by any stretch. Uh, a couple of differences, but um, I'll go through the differences. Uh, I'll do a, a cross comparison sometime later down the road between the green label and the black label. But uh, this one is 43% ABV, uh, alcohol by volume. It's... Um, According to the Heaven Hill website, it is aged four to five years, and um, I saw on some websites when I was doing some research that it's rumored to be um, five to seven years, although uh, I would believe the Heaven Hill website over the other ones. Um, it has the same exact mash bills, 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% barley. Um, and you'll find that this is just a really nice sipper. It shares a lot of the same notes that were found in the uh, the green label, but they're a little bit more accentuated just because of the slightly higher 43% um, percent ABV. So let's just uh, here show you corner in there. Um, and you'll see, you know, today I'm just kind of knocking out all these videos. I'm going to try and keep this slightly shorter uh, than the last one. I'm sorry if that ran a little long. Um, and uh, if the stories got a little mixed up, I know I had some computer interruptions and I had uh, somebody at the door. And, um, you know, if there's any story that you want more information about, or if you'd like me to highlight some of the problems that I had, uh, some of the lessons that I learned a little bit more clearly, please put that in the comments below. I'd be happy to uh, to expand on that. And also, uh, I forgot to mention, if, um, if you would please, in all the videos, this one and in the next several and in the last one, uh, please make sure that you are uh, listing the price of the featured whiskey in your location in the comments. So just kind of put where you're at and what you're finding it for. That way we can just kind of keep a running total so that people are aware of what prices they might be uh, able to expect in a certain area. Um, yeah, so Evan Williams, again, Heaven Hill product um, <clears throat> down in Bardstown, Kentucky. Uh, so this is gonna be extremely uh, similar to the last one. Uh, pretty much same notes. Heavy corn up front, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of caramel. Um, I get a pretty heavy cherry in there still. Uh, slight oak. You know, even though it's at 43%, it's not super heavy. It's, it's just a little bit more alcohol. Okay, a little more ethanol comes back up in the nasal cavity a little bit more this time. Not much, though. Um, slight cherry. The oak is more forward on this. Um, goes from like a middle sweet into a, a little bit, I'd say like a 10 second drawn out finish. Um, that is oak underlaying with a sweet caramel flavor. On the second sip, way more cherry in there. Um, the corn dust is the overlying uh, flavor and smell that I get most of all. Um, pretty good. You know, again, we're in budget territory here. Um, but you know what? Not a bad way to go. It's a good introduction to bourbon. It's got uh, several of the flavors, the cherry, the caramel, the vanillas, the oaks that you're going to find. Um, that corn dust, uh, you're going to find that in a lot of different bourbon profiles. Um, yeah, for the price, it's kind of hard to beat. Um, it's got a decent flavor. 
Uh, I'd sit and sip it. I'm going to sip it throughout this episode. And um, also, it, uh, you know, it'd make a good mixer if that's something that you're into as well. So uh, there you go. Evan Williams, Black Label. This one's a little bit easier to get your hands on compared to the Green Label as that's not distributed everywhere, but it is still pretty easy to find as well. Uh, the Black Label should be able to find most places. Um, it's a real common whiskey, easy to get on a uh, hold of. Um, and so with that, we're going to go into uh, the <clears throat> second portion of this video, which is going to be getting in shape. And uh, this is going to um, focus on several different areas. Number one, uh, we're going to hit diet exer and exercise, uh, very key things. Um, but then also, uh, I also consider getting in shape to be learning how to call, polishing up your calls, understanding the situations, and then uh, also a little bit of gear testing because you're not really fully prepared or in shape unless you have all those things kind of working together. So starting off, diet and exercise, I'm not going to go into it all that much because, hey, let's be realistic. Everybody hears the same thing. What I do want to, um, <clears throat> what I do want to hit on are a couple of key ideas. Number one, Every pound that you lose between now and when you actually go hunting is one less pound you have to carry up the mountain. So the less you weigh, the better it's going to be. And if you're out of shape, getting the conditioning in along with losing the weight is just going to make you more effective at going further, longer, having higher endurance, and being able to uh, pack that meat out. Um, the elk hunt does not stop with the killing of an animal. Really, that's where it starts. Um, and I know before I killed my first animal that I had an idea in my mind of what I thought it was going to be to pack out an animal. And I will tell you, whatever you think it's going to be, multiply it by 10, especially if you're doing it by yourself. It took three hours just to quarter the animal by myself. I had hunted, you know, most of the day already up to that point before I even started the quartering process, then three hours. Then, you know, add on there the exhaustion of pushing and pulling meat around, trying to cut stuff, trying to put meat into game bags, trying to hang it so that it was out of the way so that bears couldn't get to it, or coyotes or, uh, you know, other animals. Um, dealing with wasps and black flies by the thousands on a dead carcass, and then packing out after going through all that um, low on water, didn't really have time to eat while I was sitting there pack, um, cutting up and doing stuff. Um, so your energy levels are depleted. I mean, it was all I could do to get back. So the better shape you're in, the better off you're going to be. So diet, okay? I went into the first several hunting seasons with an old high school jock mentality of, oh, I'm doing exercise. I'm going to take this opportunity to lose weight. Don't do that. Lose the weight now. I mean, it's February. So if you lose the weight now... Um, or as you start going into the summer, <clears throat> you'll be much better off. The goal shouldn't be to lose the weight during the hunting season. By then, too late. What you want to do is lose the weight now so that while you're actually hunting, you can eat as much food and calories as you want during the day because you're going to be burning on the average three or 4,000 calories a day just walking around and doing what you need to do to actually get an elk killed. And so you want to go into it with the ability to eat as much as possible and effectively get that energy into your muscles. And, um, you know, if you're fat and out of shape and you're like, oh, I'm going to burn calories and I'm going to take this time to lose the weight and not replenish those calories, you're not going to be able to do it. That's how come I ended up bonking the first time I elk hunted in Wyoming was because I was doing just that. I didn't have enough calories or water in me, and I could barely get back to the truck. Um, so you want to make sure that your diet is reflecting that. So, you know, everybody, you know, no red meat, blah, 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 blah. Forget all that. You know, do some research on diet. Find out what's best for you. Obviously, fruits, vegetables, fiber. I eat a lot of lean red meat, so I eat, you know, elk, antelope. Uh, I do a lot of fishing, so I try and eat some trout and salmon and, um, you know, whatever else I happen to catch. Um, you know, all that stuff is really good for you. To me, I think the best stuff you can do is pretty much anything that is a whole food, right? Nothing out of boxes. Try and cut out the sugar. I find it funny that I'm giving lectures on this while I'm drinking. 
if you drink a lot, try and just cut it down or keep it in moderation or if at the very minimum, count the calories that you're consuming into your daily caloric intake, okay? So a typical shot, one and a half ounces of hard liquor is gonna be about 90 calories. So if you take a glass like this, <clears throat> a pint glass, 16 ounces, right? Say so you fill it with ice and then you fill it with, you know, a hard alcohol to somewhere in here. That's like four shots, right? So four times nine, 3,400, or sorry, 340 calories, just that. That's almost a full meal's worth of calories right there, okay? That's one drink if that's how you're counting. So just keep that in mind, add it to your caloric intake, and don't forget that if you are drinking, that there's no nutritional value in there. So it's pure calorie. You're not getting anything from it, which means you need to get those nutrients from other calories. So you're gonna have to include more calories in your diet. Um, so it kind of feeds off itself. So just keep all that stuff in mind. I know it's a little bit preachy being on a drinking channel and everything like that, but um, it's just kind of the way life goes. All right, so that's that. Exercise, right? So right now it's February. We've already failed to meet our uh, New Year's resolution. So let's throw that crap out the window. We don't care about that anymore. So what you want to do now is start to focus on just getting some exercise, right? And by the time you're hitting mid to late summer, you want to have, you know, your endurance up, your muscle level up. Um, and the main areas that you want to focus on, especially if you are coming from a state or a region that is lower in elevation, if you're going to be up in the mountains, you're going to get winded and your endurance is the only thing that you can really work on that's going to benefit you when it comes to that. You're going to be tired. You're not going to process uh, the lower levels of oxygen as well. Um, it's going to wear on you. But if you have a higher endurance level, you'll be able to deal with that better. Um, and it'll also dramatically lessen your ability, your likelihood of getting mountain sickness or altitude sickness. So um keep that in mind so what i say that is the best thing you can do for you is you're going to build your endurance and you're going to build your muscle your your lung and uh, uh what is it pulmonary cardiac and pulmonary endurance but then you also want to build your leg muscle endurance that's going to be huge for you right so basically what you're going to be doing when you're elk hunting is jumping on a stairmaster and doing, I don't know, most likely a, a minimum, even at, even where I'm hunting right now, uh, which is not very vertical, I'm still putting in somewhere around a thousand vertical feet of gain just by going up and down smaller hills. Um, so you're probably going to do a thousand to three or four thousand vertical feet a day. <clears throat> and then don't forget, you got to come back down any of that vertical that you go up. And so uh, down has got its own set of complications, but legs, it's all about the legs. So what I do is I walk with a weighted pack of like 20 or 30 pounds. I don't exceed that because you don't really want to be stressing yourself too much, but you want to have a little bit on there so that you can just get adjusted to it. My walking around pack, my hunting pack has 15 or 20 pounds in it by the time I throw three liters of water in it. So I find that to be a good training weight. So I walk, I run without any weight, just regular running, you know, two, three miles. Um, I do body squats without any weight on, so just my body weight. And I try and do, I try and do, um, you know, a hundred or so reps. Um, that's what I try and work up to. And then I try and do a hundred reps, you know, maybe morning and evening. Um, I do burpees, you know, because anything where you can include all the muscles or as many muscle groups as possible, you're burning calories and it's gonna bump up your endurance. So burpees, I do push-ups, sit-ups, your core is very important when you're um, putting on loads and trying to balance yourself as you're going up and down a hill uh, with weight on. So you need to have a solid core. Um, let's see, pull-ups if you can get them in there, although they're not as important. Um, but basically core, legs and cardio that's what you really want to be focusing on legs 
Um, I said I do squats. I do forward lunges and side lunges. I do squats with a side kick. Um, basically, you want to work anything that's going to move. Like if this is your legs, any movement with your leg out to the side like this is going to help on your inner muscles and tendons and ligaments. You're going to want to stretch and strengthen those because um, one of the hardest things you're going to find is there's a lot of blow down timber out in the mountains. And those um, stepping over that, you're going to kick your leg out to the side up and over. You're going to find that with weight on in your pack, that your hip flexors and your outside um, joints of your hip joint are going to start to burn. And um, it's really like, unless you're stretching ahead of time, there's really not a lot you can do for it. So, um, you know, the more of those types of movements you can do in training, the better, the more your body's going to be ready for that type of movement. So um, that's the kind of stuff that I do. And I, right now is the time to start. So, you know, there's a, a person that I follow. I'll put the um, I'll put the name of the YouTube channel in there. It's all Blanc or Blank TV. Um, little Asian guy doing five minute workouts. You can definitely find five minutes in your life to do a workout. Now um, those are more strength workouts, and uh, they're they're great. He does you know abs and legs and then full body workouts and whatever else. Uh, check that out for sure. Um, it'll definitely help you. I do that. So I get up every morning between 4.30 and 5. Five minutes is not that hard to get out um, and do something. I do yoga, so stretching. So I'm, I'm only 35. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to feel stuff. And I got, you know, ailments just like everybody else. Uh, that first elk I shot, when I packed it out myself, I didn't want to do an extra trip up the hill. So I loaded up a hind quarter. Uh, with some scrap in it and then put the head on all said and done and I had about a hundred and twenty pounds thereabouts on my pack and uh, I did the mile and a half with that and I definitely compressed my spine and I've had some back issues since then so don't do that take more trips if you need to uh, don't try and just grunt out heavy loads like that I, it's not recommended um, but um, when you do that kind of stuff um, you know, doing flexibility is going to help you. So yoga is really good. Um, if you can't fit in a workout, do uh, some stretches. That's a good alternative, but should be done in conjunction if at all possible. And then put in your cardio on top of it. So nothing different than what you've been told your entire life about getting in shape. But you definitely need to start doing it and doing it now. If you can work out some way, somehow, a little bit every day, awesome. If you can only do it three times a week, even better. But at a minimum, like I said, that five minute workout, if you can't do that, if you're not willing to do that, then you probably have no business being out elk hunting because you're gonna have to will yourself through a lot more pain than just five minutes a day of exercise, okay? So find the time, make the time, just get it done and do it. No excuses. Um, also getting in shape get in shape with calling, right? <clears throat> All right, so putting in the effort to learn, right? So that's what really I found bumped up my success of finding elk, getting in closer to elk, and then finally being able to actually bring them into bow range and getting a shot uh, was learning, increasing my knowledge base, learning from my mistakes. I wrote down in a journal every year exactly what I was doing, the problems I ran into, and what I thought the workarounds were going to be. Um, and then a big portion of that was calling. So thank you, Chris Rowe. Uh, again, I'll nod to you for sure because that's the method I use is uh, Chris Rowe's Rowe Hunting Resources. Uh, look it up, check it out, check him out on YouTube, check him out at his webpage. Um, I find his calling strategy, strategy to be incredibly effective, makes a lot of sense. And then just practice, get elk calls now, get reads if that's the way you're going to go, get, um, you know, diaphragms if you're going to use a diaphragm, get them now and start practicing now. That is not something to be trying to learn the week before season, especially if you don't have any experience with calls to start with. Um, but uh, go ahead and do that. Start learning to call. Start learning the sequences and seeing what um, what everything means. Um, 
or what we believe things mean. Um, I, I latch on to Chris's interpretation of stuff because it seems to have proved out for myself. And so I follow that line of logic. Um, and then finally, same as calling, don't save it to the end. Same thing with gear. Don't buy your gear the week before you're going to go or two weeks before you go. I used to work in a sporting goods store in the archery department. Nothing drove me more nuts than people coming in a month before a season, if I was lucky, sometimes a week or two before a season, coming in and going, hey, I just drew the tag of a lifetime. Oh, give me that new bow. Let me shoot it. Let me do that. Okay, if you're going to get into archery, you need to learn your equipment. And that's probably a good rule of thumb for absolutely any weapon, any kind of hunting you're doing. Learn your weapon inside and out, how it functions, how to tune it, how to, um, you know, do everything on it. Now, if you don't want to do all the work, fine, that's great. But you should at least understand how to do it, because in understanding that, that's the only way you're going to learn how to identify if there's a problem, right? So you're out in the wilderness, you're out doing stuff, you're moving, you might flip on a rock, you might drop your bow, you might get something snagged on a on a tree branch. Um, and if you're not cognizant while you're out there, paying attention, and every time something little like that happens, looking over your entire setup, top to bottom, maybe even shooting an arrow, if you're not doing that, you're gonna miss the one time that you accidentally hit your rest and knock it out of position and you go and then finally after working for you know a week you get your opportunity at the bowl of a lifetime and you draw back and your rest doesn't come up to position or whatever the the you know situation may be you need to be paying attention and the way to do that is to learn what makes your equipment tick right so that way you can keep an eye on it Again, you don't have to do all the work yourself, but you at least need to understand it so that you can see the problem when it happens, if it happens, okay? I know that sounds preachy, but really it's it, it's gonna save you in the long run. Um, I've personally had some problems while I was out in the wilderness and um, you know I had to come home a couple times uh, earlier than I wanted to because I couldn't fix what I needed to out in the field, um, but you know, I was able to find the problem and recognize it. So definitely do that. Uh, same with like, you know, test out if you're buying new camping equipment, test out your sleeping system before you get out there, test out your sleeping bag, make sure you're going to be warm enough. Uh, and test out your rain gear and whatever clothing it is that you think you're going to wear when you're out there. Make sure that it works in hot weather or it works in cold weather or it works in crappy weather. Chances are, if you go on a hunt that's even a weekend, but more likely three to five days, if you're in that time frame, you are most likely going to experience cold weather, hot weather, wind, maybe some precip, might be snow, might be rain. Um, so if you haven't tried your equipment out to make sure it's going to work for you, you're really, really rolling the dice. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend that. So try out your boots, try out your pack. Um, Try out your weapon system, whatever that's going to be. Try out your binoculars. Make sure that if, like, so again, I do a lot of archery elk hunting. So in archery, make sure you have all your gear on, your pack, and however you're going to set up. So binoculars being one of the main things, the bino harnesses, everybody's kind of into those now. Make sure you put all that gear on. Figure out how your snaps and your clips on your pack are going to fit. And then go shoot some arrows with all that gear on. Because without it, you know, you can easily draw back your bow and then find out that the string, when you're coming back, is going to get uh, hung up on your bino harness or on your um, your strap for your um, pack or, you know, any number of things. And the only way to figure that out ahead of time is to try it. I personally, when I train, I go out to our range that we are members of. We have a 3D course. Last summer, I was out there every morning at sunup because I wanted to be shooting with the sun and the shadows in my face, at my back. What are my pins going to look like with the sun at this angle, uh, with the thermals coming down, with the thermals going up? Um, you know, oftentimes here in Wyoming, it's, you know, it starts out 50 or 60 degrees in the morning and within an hour, it's 70, 80, 90 degrees. So, I like seeing what happens with that temperature swing. 
how do I feel with all my gear on? What's it like running up and down the hill and then trying to make a shot? Um, you know, getting my heart rate up because when you're in the moment, your heart rate's going to be up. You probably just got done hiking up a mountain. You got a little bit of adrenaline going, all that stuff. Trying to put as many of those variables in as possible and practicing with that, finding out how all your gear fits into that is critical. Absolutely critical. And not doing that ahead of time is probably the most sure way I can think of to create failure. I've seen it in my own fault um, with some of the other uh, hunting trips I've been on. I've, I've, I've seen things go wrong. I've seen it with people who I hunt with, their ill preparedness, uh, costing them opportunity and time and, uh, and money. You know, you got a lot of money invested in all this stuff. So um, get out there and practice and just, just get in shape, you know. Uh, you don't have to be as crazy as, as maybe I am or other people are, but you definitely should start doing it. I mean, it's February now. Um, I'll probably start shooting here. The snow will be melting March, April, May. You'll get them, you know, it's 50 degrees today, but, uh, and I could go shoot today, but, um, you know, I'm typically in end of March is about when I really start shooting. And I'll shoot from March all the way up until the day of my hunt. And then while I'm hunting, even I'll take and shoot a couple arrows throughout the, the time that I'm out there hunting. Um, I don't know. I just believe that it, it, practice, you can't practice enough. I practice with all of my gear on. You'll find, um, especially if you're new to it, that when you have weight on, especially a 20 or 30 pound pack, when you go to draw and how the shoulder straps and everything's sitting on you and pulling on you, it's going to change your Form, which changes your point of impact in archery. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, I'm going to drop my pack. So they don't practice with a pack on, or they don't practice with their quiver on, or they don't practice with whatever. Whatever it is you think you're going to do, just make sure you practice that setup. Um, and that's kind of the final piece of getting in shape, is um, getting in shape physically, mentally, skill-wise, knowledge-wise, and then, you know, making sure your gear and everything's lined out as well. Try it all, try it all out, get it out there. If you find problems, now's the time to resolve them. Or if you need a new piece of equipment, go and get that. But figure it out now instead of right before season. Okay. So get off my soapbox on that. On that. Uh, I'm going to enjoy this whiskey a little bit longer. And uh, you know what? If you get the time or are interested in it, go on, get yourself some Black Label Evan Williams. It's a Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Um, you know what? For the price point, it's not a bad whiskey at all. Something you can enjoy if you go out there and uh, you just want something to sip on. And uh, start thinking about this fall. It's coming up quicker than you think. And... Um, you can't start soon enough when it comes to getting in shape. Hope you guys have yourselves a great day, and I will catch you later. Thanks for watching.